Hello and welcome to tonight at 8 from the RSGB. Whilst most amateurs have their main radio station at home, there can be lots of benefits to portable operating, including getting away from local interference problems and experiencing new natural surroundings. Well, someone who really enjoys operating portable is Ben Lloyd, GW4BML, and he's here tonight to show us how we can pack an effective station into a rucksack and make the most of being outside. Welcome to Tonight at 8, Ben. Can you give us a quick preview of what you'll be covering this evening? Yes, yeah, certainly. Good evening, David. Um, I'm going to give a brief description on portable operating. I'm going to run through a few examples, uh, explain the benefits, some generic and some from my personal experience. Uh, and I'm going to go through my rucksack in detail and then I'll end with some stories and uh, adventures. It sounds brilliant. Look forward to that. And before your presentation, a reminder that if you're watching this on Monday, the 9th of January, then this is live and you can ask questions or make comments on either BATC or YouTube chat at any time during the presentation or straight afterwards. Please include your first name and call sign if you have one within every message. And note that you can make this video stream fill your screen on most devices, usually by double clicking on the picture or pressing the full screen button. But now back to Ben to find out how you can take your hobby to the great outdoors. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, okay, good, uh, good e evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to start off uh, with what is portable operating. So, uh, portable operating is usually signified by amateur radio operators appending the suffix stroke P to their call sign. Uh, so, myself, who does quite a lot of operating portable, would use Golf Whiskey 4, Bravo, Mike Lima, Stroke Portable uh, when I'm operating portable in Wales. And it's a Golf Mike 4 for Scotland, Golf 4 for England, and Golf India 4 for, um, for Ireland. What does portable operating mean? Um, operating Stroke Portable normally means that amateur stations are operating away from their licensed station address. Uh, a few examples uh, of operating portable. You could be on holiday. I've got a good friend of mine uh, in that picture, actually, uh, who comes down to Mid Wales, uh, where I live. And uh, we do speak on um, two meters VHF now and again with each other. Uh, you could be operating from a park. Uh, they do parks on the air, uh, which is quite a big uh, scheme in um, amateur radio now, uh, where you set up in a park and uh, call out and work many stations. Uh, now, this is this is a, a funny one. I used to live uh, on top of a hill uh, in mid Wales with a very, very good takeoff for um, for VHF and UHF. And I used to get so many people. It was very popular walking their dog and um, taking their hand held with them over the hills. So I've made many contacts with people. Uh, which I've heard call in CQ on um, uh, S20 or 145 500, the call in channel. And um, yeah, it, it seemed to be quite a lot of people about. So that was a very popular one, uh, pop portable operating. Um, you could be at a field day. Uh, I've been to quite a few field days. Some we've held um, here in Mid Wales as well. And we've been setting up equipment, running batteries uh, on the radios and uh, beams up in the air, um, working portable. Uh, or pedestrian portable chilling, uh, basically taking a few hours off in the day and having a chill and calling out CQ. But uh, the most of all, which I'm going to concentrate on uh, in my presentation this evening, is um, on a mountain. Uh, that uh, That's what I do quite a lot of. So I'll start uh, just by giving five generic uh, benefits of operating portable um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to move on and give five um, benefits which I personally have um, experienced over the last couple of years uh, taking my radio and rucksack to a hill. So we'll start off with a low noise interference level. So there's nothing worse than experiencing a high noise level. Uh, this normally occurs at your home QTH station due to many electronical uh, appliances. Some of the worst, you've got your Wi-Fi routers or your PoE plugs power over any ethernets uh, causing a good S5, S9 plus of noise. Now I just moved, as I said before, QTH. Uh, I used to live on a hill, I had zero noise, it was great. And uh, now I live in a village and I do feel sorry for people that have noise because I've got S9 of noise at my home QTH and there is nothing worse. And especially this time of year, 
Lots of children love it, but amateurs hate it. You've got the Christmas lights, which uh, are all lit up. And where I live in the village, I've got lots of them. So uh, the, the noise floor is really bad. So the benefit, uh, when going stroke portable, you will find that your noise level um, is anything from S1 to an S0. Uh, and you can really, really, really hear the faint stations, which uh, you can't hear at all at home. Um, so... Um, uh, yeah, as soon as you get away from the electronical noise that makes up the urban environment uh, the majority of us live in, you start to notice some big benefits when it comes to amateur radio. Uh, turning on the radio um, away from civilization is a breath of fresh air. Often I see the noise levels across the HF bands, as, as I said, S1 and uh, even S0 of noise. A perfect example is we, um, uh, when I operate uh, summits on the air on a mountain, um, and I'm chasing from my home QTH, you can generally hear one uh, amateur uh, who's calling out uh, CQ, SOTA, and there's another one that calls into him. We call it a summit to summit. So it's one mountain to another, SOTA summit to a SOTA summit. And you can generally hear the one operator and uh, you can't hear the other. And they're within the skip as well. And that's because of your noise floor. So going portable um, certainly helps uh, this matter and you'll hear and receive signals a lot better. Uh, number two. Antenna experiments. Um, due to garden space at your home QDH, certainly I have now, you can't get the best out of each band. Uh, example, 160 meter dipole, 80 meter N fed half wave, uh, or any long wire. Uh, you struggle um, to, get, uh, to get up in the garden. Um, going portable, the benefit is uh, you have space to try out different antennas you cannot do at home. So, just imagine if you've got a full size 160 meter dipole uh, up in a field somewhere and you're calling out, you're getting the best out of that band. It's a resonant antennae and you can just work some stations that you wouldn't be able to do at home. It really is a good benefit. A friend of mine, um, MW0SAW, I will talk a little bit more uh, about uh, some of the antennas he's made for me and built for me, uh, has just made an 80 meter N fed half wave. And I'd done a couple of activations over the last few weeks using that. And 80 meters is a band I do quite like. And to go out portable and push 10 watts through a resonant antenna is uh, completely different than using your well, 40 meter N fed half wave and tuning it on summit. You uh, receive much better and your signal gets out there much, much stronger. So to work 80 meters from a summit uh, is fantastic to be fair. So uh, operating portable, this is, this is where you'll benefit with your longer antennas. A uh, good advert for the hobby. So operating outside visible to the public eye enables interest and questions will be asked. Um, there's been ma many, many a times where I've been on a mountain and I've had uh, well, antennas up in the air. Sometimes I've had two. I've had uh, my HF antennae up and my two meter, uh, 70 centimeters um, antennae, um, antennae up as well. And I get so many people crowding around asking uh, questions. What are you doing? You do get the odd funny questions. Are you fishing <laughs> or any, uh, something like that? But um, no, the, the public eye really, really does come and ask questions. And, and the benefit is uh, when going portable, you receive interest in the hobby and could get more folk wanting, uh, wanting to try it. So as I say, being outside and visible um, inevitably means that passersby will ask questions about what you're doing. Um, I've been able to explain the hobby to many people uh, who would never otherwise have heard, heard of it. I always take the time to explain what I'm doing in an interesting and accessible way if I'm approached while out portable. People are naturally intrigued and my interactions with people have been positive. The spectrum of responses range from them thinking you're absolutely crazy to extreme interest. I did an activation in um, the Lake District on a hill called the Old Man of Coniston. Um, there was a day organized up there. And the amount of people that uh, I had questions of, it was a good 20 plus people. It was, it was a nice day. It was busy and there was a lot of interest. And um, the hobby that I do, uh, SOTA, uh, have created a little, Q, um, uh, a little badge uh, where you scan a QR code and it explains, so you, you can go back and it takes you to the website of SOTA, explains what you're doing. And that was, uh, that was being used quite a lot. So it was a very, very good little beneficial badge. Um, so that's definitely a good advert for the hobby. It's something different. Uh, okay, so if you're getting slightly bored of operating from home, then try new things out. Um, 
try portable operating. And the benefits of it is it's a new part of the hobby to you. You may like it. Uh, it opens more doors than just one. Uh, moving on from that point, it's good for you. Amateur radio outside offers fresh air and the chance of exercise. Um, again, what's the benefit? Uh, when going portable, you can do both above, so you can have fresh air, keep fit, and you can also include your hobby, uh, so do something that you enjoy doing. So I'm, what, what I'm going to move on to now uh, is five um, points that I've experienced myself from a scheme which I really love doing and I'm quite passionate about called SOTA, uh, Summits on the Air. Now, this presentation this evening that I'm presenting uh, is on portable operating. <clears throat> so I'm not going to go into great depth on SOTA. Uh, that's another presentation. Um, but if you want to visit uh, the SOTA website, there's the link. Feel free to. It's an absolutely brilliant scheme. Uh, you meet so many new people and friends. Um, so so there, there's the link. Have a read. And if you do fancy it, have a go. So these are what I've learned um, from going operating uh, SOTA summits. A great takeoff. Now, portable operation from hilltops and open spaces offer unobstructed takeoffs. Um, the benefit when going portable, you never know where your signal is going to end up in the world. The excitement. So there's many, many, many summits that I've worked from in, in North Wales, South Wales, Mid Wales, up at the Lake District, even Scotland, even abroad. Uh, it, Wales are the best, um, where I've uh, I've been calling CQ SOTA on um, S20, 145, uh, 500 on um, two meters. And when I QSY to another frequency, I call out and uh, you get a golf mic station or a mic mic station calling into you when you're operating in South Wales, for example, on two meters. Uh, it's just the excitement, and and I love I love the I don't know is it the buzz, but I absolutely love just de keying the microphone and just listening to a different call sign uh, and, and seeing how far you can actually get um, on on two meters. Um, and and another thing as well is a portable operation uh, from hilltops uh, op uh, in open spaces offers un unobstructable takeoffs. So on HF, this means more of your power is being radiated effectively to the ionosphere as there's no building or objects to obstruct the signal. So um, you put, put a HF vertical, let's just say, on a mountain top, and the low angle takeoff really starts to do the business. So uh, you, you'll find that operating portable sometime, uh, sometimes is, is a lot, lot, lot more beneficial than operating from home. So definitely take it, uh, take it into consideration on going uh, to operate portable if you if you want to uh, work some stations on two meters FM because it certainly works and it is really the excitement's great. Now, QRP uh, becomes a lot easier. Now this is one of my favourite ones. Struggling to get out or call into stations from your home QTH using QRP. Now I have all I have also been an M7 and a two zero in the last three years. So I started off. Um, as Mike, uh, Mike Whiskey 7, Bravo, Mike Lima. And from my home QDH, calling into stations, I think quite a lot of us have done it. I've been there shouting down the microphone, Mike Whiskey 7, Bravo, Mike Lima. Mike Whiskey 7, Bravo, Mike Lima. And you usually de-key the mic and uh, they've completely you know, ignored you. They've acknowledged someone else uh, because they've got a lot stronger signal. Um, I went down the route then. I was told to um, to basically call QRP. So I tried that. Mike Whiskey 7, Bravo, Mike Lima, stroke QRP, stroke QRP. And by the time you de-key the microphone, they're halfway through uh, uh, the radio report or a conversation with someone else that um, that has called in. So it, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a struggle on times. Um, but when you go operate in portable, less is more. So the benefit when operating portable, the stations or chasers you are listening for uh, are listening for you. Um, sorry, the stations or chasers are listening for you. So how the tables have turned. Now, when perfect example, when you're doing SOTA, when you're doing POTA, you spot. So there's so many stations out there listening for you. So 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 let them stations, let let the the bigger stations inside the home QTH shacks do the work. You're calling out. You are the boss there. 
Um, so, so QRP power uh, becomes really, really, really strong power. And, and believe me, from activating, or well, I, I don't know how many um, portable operation uh, operate uh, operations I've done in the in the past, but uh, ten watts, five watts is ample. Uh, if you're on a, on a hilltop or out in the open, five watts into a resonant antenna, you you will you will work work the world uh, when when the conditions are there, one hundred percent. So definitely take portable operating into uh, um, effect when um, when uh, you want to work quite a lot of stations because uh, a lot of power doesn't doesn't mean uh, doesn't mean anything. Fine tune your op skills. Okay, have you ever worked a pileup or had to listen with your ear stuck against the radio um, speaker? I'm very lucky when I go operating. I've got someone to log for me. <laughs> She's nearly two. Her handwriting's not the best, but no. Um, basically, when you've got uh, when you've got people calling into you, um, you dekey the microphone, and there could be up to ten, twenty, even thirty stations calling at once, uh, and faint stations as well coming through, which you have to stick your ear to your uh, to your speaker on the on the radio. Uh, what's the benefit? When going portable, uh, doing SOTA will certainly improve these skills for you. Now, you, I've called CQ Sota quite a lot, and I've over the past four year I've kind of got four magic radio reports. I call them. The first one is five nine. The second one is five five. The third one is four four, and the fourth one is three and three. So if I've got people calling into me. And I can barely hear them, but I can make out what they're saying. They're a three and a three. If I've got someone calling into me, they're not so loud, but they're pretty understandable. That's a four and four to me. Now, this is all my personal uh, radio reports. If they're coming through to me, but not as strong as all the rest, they're a five and a five. And if they're absolutely booming into me, they're a five and a nine. Now, I've picked these four four radio reports because when the rain is hitting you from every single angle you can imagine and when you're on top of a hill somewhere when the rain is coming down or the sleet or the snow or the hail is hitting the floor and it's bouncing back off and hitting you on your face hitting you on your nose going in your eyes um, you don't really want to be looking at your radio all the time to give the exact possible radio report plus sometimes they can't hear you because the weather is battering your antennae so five nine I always use with uh, quite a lot of my friends will know top of the shop. So uh, if I'm calling five nine five nine five nine and uh, the person on the other end can't hear me, I will just try and shout top of the shop and I'll just make sure I can get shop out there a few times. And then I will generally hear nine times out of ten. They'll come back to me and say shop. OK, five nine. Thank you, Ben. And then five five because five five all the fives all the fives 55 five it just works and four and four is the, the same and three and three when they're lower down they're just easier numbers to pick out when um, the other station struggles to hear you uh and, and, and um when they ask i've got the first number ben i've got the first number i just haven't got the second one well if you just keep shouting that one number it's the same there's a there's a fair possibility that they will that they will pick it up so operating portable certainly does um, tune your operate op, op skills. It's uh, it's very good. Sense of adventure. So you get to visit some really remote and interesting places around the UK and world. Uh, certainly when you're operating uh, in the SOTA scheme. So there's uh, myself, little liar in the carrier, and uh, Alan G. A golf whiskey for Victor Papa X-ray, a very good friend of mine. Uh, we're on top of Bardsey Island there. So we, we um, had a boat across to Bardsey Island. Uh, we had an extremely nice day. That's not Photoshop. That is a proper photo uh, of, um, of the actual weather we had that day. And we operated and worked, uh, again, a lovely pilot because not many people travel to these uh, remote locations. So as soon as you put the radio up with the antennae and call out, you do get a lovely pilot. I've also traveled abroad uh, to Germany. Uh, a few times and I've uh, met up with some friends in Germany who I've met um, over uh, through SOTA and they've kindly picked me up from the hotel. 
they're generally business trips so it's quite nice to to go abroad and uh, and in my free time manage to get picked up and um, go and call out CQ Sota from a new unique summit in Germany uh, so sense of adventure it, it, it's great so the benefits again is there's nothing better than walking a mountain ridge um, and doing your hobby at the same time it's it's uh, very enjoyable then moving on to awards and challenges and not everybody's focused on awards um, but if you are SOTA certainly entertains in this respect and I believe it's not just SOTA I think POTA does as well and I think there's is it world uh, wide fauna flora or flora fauna excuse me I could have got that wrong but I, I don't do much with with that but I know that's another scheme uh, like I say, I know, I know everybody's um, not into awards, but if you are, uh, SOTA does give challenges. It doesn't just give challenges that you have to compete against other people. Uh, it gives challenges for yourself uh, so you can set your own goals. So don't let it put you off um, by thinking, oh, it's a challenging um, scheme. It certainly isn't. It's just all on yourself. You, you, you don't have to... Um, put uh, challenges into it at all uh, but if you wanted to add a few challenges for yourself um, and set a few goals it's there you can do it um, and at the end my goal was to aim for mountain goat and I managed to uh, hit my mountain goat status in the 18th of June so I managed to receive my my trophy for that it was hard work but we'll uh, explain a little bit about that on my uh, as we go through the presentation so the benefit, as I was saying, uh, you can achieve your set goal and can get rewarded with trophies and certificates. Now, a question I get asked uh, from a summit, what's in the rucksack or what equipment are you using? And I feel <laughs> not rude because um, I try my best to be as polite as I possibly can when, when I'm on a mountain top in all kinds of weather conditions. But uh, as I was uh, explaining before, when you're getting rain chucked at you and sleet and someone asks, so what, what are your conditions? It's quite hard down again to, to hear and explain. So I thought this would be a really, really good opportunity to explain uh, what I have in my rucksack. But before I do share this with you, I'm just going to run through briefly of my past uh, when I first started doing portable operating. Um, I began when I was a two whiskey zero, uh, bravo Mike Lima, I began with the Yezu FT817 uh, ND, which was a fantastic little radio, uh, and I made my own antennas, which was the uh, dipole, a resonant dipole, a linked dipole uh, for 40 and 20 meters. This worked very well. This was a very, very good setup. But as I started to get into the scheme more and more, um, I felt it was too heavy, um, uh, especially on a 10 to 15, if not 20 mile hike in a day. Uh, the second thing was the battery, unfortunately, didn't last as long and it would only push 2.5 watts out from the internal battery. And if I took a, an external battery with me, again, it just added weight. And the other thing was uh, when you're basically... Uh, on top of a, of a hill or, or, or wherever you're operating from and something happens the wire like your antenna wire snaps or your the wind is too um it's it's blowing too hard you can't put your pole up the full length and the the, the vswr isn't a hundred hundred percent correct there isn't a built-in tuner on the uh, the 817 nd so you had to take an external tuner which again added weight so i sat down i changed my um rucksack and i went for the um, Xegu X6100, uh, which was an absolutely amazing radio. Uh, uh, it uh, had a built-in tuner, so it would tune literally tune a screwdriver. It would tune anything. That little radio, would I, I've still got it. It's it's what well, it is. My spare radio. It's a it's a perfect um, radio. Only one thing I found was uh, the receive a little bit. I was struggling on times to hear the faint stations. So when you get Summit to Summit's calling into you from, um, uh, well, uh, abroad or <clears throat> the UK, the, the signal is a little bit down because uh, obviously they are also QRP. Um, so I found that the, the, the receive was just that. It just couldn't make out some of the words. So after that, I decided to, um, to treat myself. So my current rucksack, which has been for the last four months uh, at least, is an Ellicraft KX2. Uh, radio uh, with the tuner and in external mic. I use a uh, so there's the Ellicraft. 
Uh, I use an RS Pro 14.8 volt lithium ion battery. Uh, that's 14.8 volts. The Ellicraft will take up to 16 volts. Um, I've spoken to, to them and that's what's in their specification. And that battery will probably last me on at least five or six summits operating for about anything from 30 minutes to 45 minutes, uh, pushing 12 watts. So the Ellicraft uh, with the latest firmware installed into it and anything over 12.8 volts will uh, will push 12 watts out the actual radio. <clears throat> and uh, and it, it, yeah, it works. It, uh, it does a good day for me uh, when I'm out on the hills. So I have a three meter um, RG174 patch lead, uh, which connects to my MW zero S A W N fed half wave uh, for twenty uh, for forty and twenty meters. There it is, extremely light. Um, and uh, Steve made made that for me, and it uh, it works on forty and twenty. I don't have to use the tuner, um, and it will also um, work on I believe uh, twelve and ten, and it it uh, it, it tunes I have to tune it on fifteen. Um, Perfect uh, antennae works really well. It goes it, it goes up similar. It, it's in an in inverted V. That's how I run it. So it goes um, literally in the middle. I've got like a little. You can see a little um, orange clip, which is uh, in my um, in my photo there. Uh, that that stands at the center of my pole, and I've got uh, I, I stand about it'd be about 20, 20 foot away with my radio. Then I have a Soto Beam six meter tactical mini pole. Uh, there's a bit of a story about that in a second. Uh, yeah, my six meter tactical mini pole um, and uh, my accessories. So I take my walking poles with me everywhere. It's one of my best friends, that is, when I'm on a hill. One of them is used to prop the, the winder up of my antennae. Uh, my pegs are in the bag, and I've also got my um, antennae guide to um, to hold um, the antennae, uh, the mast up, sorry. Now, just a quick story about the tactical mini. Um, my tactical mini that I've got here is a six meter tactical mini and I call it triggers broom off um, only fools and horses because uh, brilliant quality. It's an amazing pull uh, and it's done me so, so well. But uh, due to the conditions I operate in portable, it's uh, it's broken probably about five or six sections. So like uh, like Trigger says, he's had about uh, five new poles and about six new broom heads. Well, my tactical mini is uh, is had probably about five or six new poles, but um, it's it's still going strong. Uh, I've had to use my six meter carbon the last few days uh, due to uh, I'm waiting for a pole to come in for the bottom, but it is due in, so to beams have told me very soon. So it'll be back. <laughs> it'll be back with me uh, in the next uh, next few weeks. So that's my HF setup. And then moving on to VHF and UHF, um, I use the Yezu FT65E handheld. Uh, five watts and I've purchased I think it's two two thousand four hundred milliamp hour battery for the for the back it comes with a one thousand nine hundred milliamp hour battery and uh, and I purchased the bigger one there to uh, I think it's yeah two two point four amps two two thousand four hundred milliamps and that will last me again all day I do carry a spare battery with me just in case but it's a fantastic bit of kit get quite a lot of good radio reports with my uh, FT65 and uh, and it's worked it's uh, it's worked uh, quite far on the, on the hills then um, again, that runs into my two meter stroke, 70 centimeter Slim G antenna from communi uh, Spectrum Communications. Uh, and by the way, all the links uh, are underneath these, by the way, I should have said at the, at the start, if you, uh, if you wanted to have a look. Um, I started off with a homemade two meter antenna and I couldn't understand why my signal, I wasn't receiving the best. And a, a good friend told me to go for the Spectrum Communications uh, two meter uh antenna and i did and, and i've never looked back i've got a stock i've got stock of them here <laughs> and uh, they're, they're absolutely great they work very very well so um i do recommend that antenna if anybody is after a good portable two meter antenna um, and then again a soda beams four meter telescopic pole which i take with me in my bag so, so i've always got two poles i've got the six meter and the four meter just in case something did happen to the six meter which it has, I can use the four meter and the, the tuner on the, the Ellicraft to, to bring the SWR in if um, if need be. So that's my VHF and UHF setup. Now, the rest of the rucksack to me is the most important bits. And what I've just gone through is probably the lightest part that I carry with me. 
the radio equipment doesn't weigh much at all. Uh, it's the rest of it. So I carry medical supplies, uh, quite a lot of medical supplies to, uh, supplies, to be honest with you, which includes um, a foil blanket, um, plaster spray and uh, heat pads for your hands, heat pads for your feet. And I always think to myself, I'm quite um, class myself as quite an experienced hiker uh, in quite a lot of different weathers, but you never know who you're going to come across. So you might not need it for yourself. Um, you might come across someone else that needs it. So I always, even if it's a nice day, uh, to be honest with you, in my summer pack, I carry my medical supplies because uh, you never know when you'll need it. Uh, correct clothing, that is the weight of my bag. So I think I take about, well, when the weather's really bad, I probably got about two jackets and three coats in my rucksack with me that I take for wind, for rain, for hail, for wet, uh, and two pairs of leggings because uh, I do tend to go out in all kinds of weather. So the correct clothing is um, is one of uh, the majors that go in my my rucksack and food and drink. Um, so water and uh, just a few bites and, and snacks. Um, in my opinion, the most important them three are, to be honest with you. And then moving on to keep as safe as you can. I carry a Garmin GPS Pro 66i. Uh, this uh, this is I, I pay, I think it's £12.99 a month. And if anything uh, was to happen to me, if I if I fall or if someone else uh, had fallen and I come across them, I've got a little button which I press on the side, which says SOS. And um, that that messages my family instantly and also sends a message to the air ambulance and the ambulance service pinpointing where I am and knowing that uh, something's not right. So uh, they start to hopefully start to look look out. And that also uh, has GPS on it. So I, I know exactly where I am. I can share my location with anybody I want to uh, so they can track me and it works off satellites as well. So it's, it's not like your phone. <clears throat> I've come across many summits before where I've tried to spot, uh, which we spot for SOTA and um, it's um, it's not worked because I've had no signal or no 4G. Um, this has got inReach built into it, uh, which uses the satellites to transmit and, and they work very, very well. Uh, wherever I've been so far, this has managed to send a message and it does spot for me as well on SOTA. So if I've got no coverage at all, I can still get hold of the family to let them know I'm OK. And um, I can also spot so everybody can call into me and I can qualify the summit. Uh, <clears throat> another thing is, is uh, the ASU FT5D, which I carry with me um, on my uh, my rucksack strap. Uh, and this has usually got APRS switched on. You'll find APRS is very, very good. Uh, sometimes it won't work when you're low down. It's got to pick up um, an, a, a beacon uh, for, for the eye gate to transmit your your packet to, to upload onto the Internet to, to spot you type of thing. But I always keep it on. And you'll usually hear when you're halfway quarter or three quarters of the way up of a mountain where you're going, you'll hear it starting to beep and make noises and the packets have been received. So so um, you've got two uh, options then uh, for safety. So that is another very important um, thing when you're going out portable, really, especially on the hills. Uh, just make sure you carry some safety equipment with you and someone knows where you are. OK, GW4 BML Portable Adventures. Right. I'm just going to run through a few of my adventures, uh, what I've done over the last um, year. So I'll start off with my uh, trip to... Scotland to meet uh, Fraser, Mike, Mike Zero, Echo, Foxtrot, India, Portable. Uh, when when I first met Fraser, it was a uh, we, we'd never met. We'd spoken over the radio a couple of times or I called into him on um, SOTA activations. And I said I was coming up to Scotland and I and I asked him, did uh, did he fancy doing a joint activation? And uh, he agreed. So I went up. So it was the first time we met. And he likes Land Rovers. He likes rallying. And he does radio. So we got on like a house on fire. It's three things that I, <laughs> I really enjoy. So um, we went to activate three summits. It was a 38 kilometer um, hike. It started off on a bike, which <laughs> I found pretty hard. Uh, I can walk, I can hike, I can climb anywhere, but put me on a bike. Goodness me, when I first done the first five kilometers, I, I got off the bike. My legs were shaking. I really didn't think I could carry on. But I soon got into I soon got into the into the swing of things. So the first summit we did was Ben Mahoyne, uh, GM stroke ES 005, uh, where we uh, we both um, 
hiked to and we qualified. Uh, Fraser worked HF and I worked uh, two meters FM. Then we we walked across, uh, hiked across um, the, the ridge ridges to Ben McDewey, uh, GMES001. And we found conditions on Ben McDewey to be not very good considering it's a 10 point summit and it's the second highest summit in um in the uk uh, and on two meters it was uh, it was quite quiet we qualified but it was quite quiet uh, and then the last summit was kind behind uh, gmes 013 now this is where the fun uh, started so i set up my two meter station and fraser set up hf and I could hear Fraser calling CQ Sota, CQ Sota in the background, and he could hear me calling CQ Sota in the background. This went on for about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, there was, um, unfortunately, uh, we received an X-class solar flare of descent proportions. So um, all the bands were dead. We, we just could not. It was an eight-point summit, uh, and uh, we were struggling to qualify. I managed three contacts in the log, and uh, we need four to qualify on Sota. Fraser managed two contacts in the log and I think it was about 10, 15 minutes, if not 20 minutes later, uh, 20 meters uh, opened up and we managed to work two. Well, I managed to work one. I shared the microphone with Fraser and uh, Fraser managed to work another one. So it was a very, uh, very interesting trip, but thoroughly enjoyed. And um, yeah, I uh, definitely go back up there, but it's, it's Fraser's turn to come back down here now. So I, I'm waiting for, for him to come down. Uh, and then it was the island of Alsa Crag with a family, again in Scotland. Um, so there the island is. It stands, um, yes, south um, south of uh, Scotland. A lovely island. Um, but the only issue uh, was, um, is this me halfway up with little Lyra. Uh, when, when we received, uh, when, when we arrived there on the boat, the, um, the gentleman that was uh, uh, driving the boat there for us turned around and he said, um, due to the tide, um, it's going to be um, uh, going out later, the, earlier than we expected. You've only got two hours on the island. Now, bearing in mind, this was uh, about just over a mile vertical climb to the top. And obviously a mile down, I had to get up there, set the station up, call out and come back down um, within, uh, within two hours. So you can quite imagine it was quite a rush. Uh, I, I got little Lyra up, ha well, about three quarters of the way, and uh, unfortunately, she had to stay with uh, with um, Martha then, um, Mum. Uh, well, I carried on sprinting the rest to, to get to the top, and uh, I did manage to activate it. But that was a very, yeah, if you read up about Alsa Crag, very interesting um, activation that was, and uh, I, I made quite a lot of quite a lot of contacts. Uh, the, the Lake District quadruple, uh, with glorious weather. Don't generally get a lot of good weather when you're out uh, operating Sota. Uh, Saint Sunday Crag was the first um, summit I activated on. Uh, I then moved on to Fairfield. Uh, there's my little uh, summer bag, uh, which is uh, it helps with weight as well uh, that I uh, use in the summer. Saint Seat Sandal was the next one. That was once you've done Saint Sunday Crag because it's a fair pull up to Saint Sunday Crag. Fairfield's not too bad because you walk the ridge and then seat sandal, you basically drop down from Fairfield right into a dip and uh, you've got another couple of hundred meters that you just climb straight uphill. So um, it was it was hard going being the, the third summit to go on. Uh, and then I finished off on Helvellyn and that was, yeah, in the name, that wasn't the, the nicest, uh, nicest of treks, but uh, but I managed it. And what um, one thing out of this trip that I noticed, all these summits are uh, within within probably a mile of each other uh, as the crow flies and i found different call signs call signs calling into me from each summit so uh, they, and, and, and amateurs were saying they couldn't hear me from one summit but they could from another so it's surprising what does get in the way um, of the two meter signal now and again so sometimes there could be a lift or you're bouncing off something uh, maybe I was bouncing off um, another mountain. My signal was to, to to get to another contact. But you do find that when you're the same height, uh, but you've just literally moved about a quarter of a mile, uh, half a mile or even a mile, and your, uh, your signal kind of um, disappears to the station you were talking to on the previous. But that was a lovely that was a lovely trek. And if there's any any anybody listening that does um, SOTA, I really, really do recommend that. It's, it's a nice day out in the summer. A very, very nice hike. So... North, South and Mid Wales favourites. Um, I 
went on a mission this year, last year as well to complete uh, Wales uh, as all the SOTA summits. And my last North Wales summit was Monith Reed V, uh, Golf Whiskey, November Whiskey number 73. And as I did this summit, I was getting closer towards it. Uh, Martha came with me as well, my XYL. And in the distance, I could see, I was sure there was someone standing at the summit. Um, but anyway, carried on walking towards it. And the, yeah, when I got pretty close, I noticed um, Alid, a very, very good friend of mine, had actually walked to the summit uh, to join me on my last uh, completion of North Wales. And uh, yeah, we, we both had a drink together on summit, which was, which was very nice. Um, and then South Wales. I completed uh, South Wales uh, and finished off with Wentwood. And this was a picture illustrating um, how we sometimes have to put our antennas up. And this was a very, very, very overgrown uh, kind of uh, forest. Uh, so, yeah, it was quite hard work getting the antenna up, but um, we managed it in the end uh, and uh, did, did qualify the summit. But yeah, there, there is some very, very awkward places now and again where you have to, uh, you have to erect your pole to, uh, to, um, to put your antenna up. And then uh, I finished, finished Wales with Brynna Van, uh, Golf Whiskey, Mike Whiskey, number 18, which is not far from uh, my house with uh, me, Martha and little Lyra. And uh, there Lyra is pointing, pointing at the summit, telling me where, uh, where I've got to go. So, yeah, adventures in Wales are, are, are always good. Friends and family. Um, you meet so many friends uh, when you're um, in SOTA and, and amateur radio, full stop. But um, doing SOTA, I've, I've met, met loads of really, really nice people. So that was my last activation in um, South Wales at the end, where there's um, Steve, uh, Kevin, and Kevin's XYL Liz. They come to meet me and join me, which was uh, fantastic. Um, family hike to, tr uh, to climb Trevan. Uh, this was one where Martha, Martha's always wanted to, to climb Trevan before. And uh, we decided to, it was a nice day. We decided to pack the bag and go for a walk. And, and we, we did manage it. We had some funny looks, especially with a massive aerial on top of um, Trevan, because it's not what you'd uh, generally expect to see up there. But it was thoroughly enjoyable. And, uh, and there's uh, me and Mrs. BML Martha on Scaffold Pike, uh, Golf Lima Delta number one. That was quite a bad uh, day for weather. But yeah, we, we did it and, uh, and it was, uh, was very in enjoyable. Now, challenges and awards. Uh, Mountain Goat Activation, I did on a Golva, which is a local summit to me, Golf Whiskey, November Whiskey 061. It's a few miles down the road. Uh, that was uh, 178 summits, which took 365 days to get my 1,000 points. I was determined to get it. Um, so, yeah, that, that was a real good day. I was joined by Alan, Golf Whiskey 4, Victor Papa X-Ray. He, he um, joined me uh, on that day, which was really nice. And there he is again. Uh, he invited me back to join him on his completion of Wales uh, on a summit called Myarth in South Wales. So there's the two of us. Again, we did notice some X-Class solar flares um, on that day, which prevented the signal. So uh, we were <laughs> we were um, getting a bit scared at one point, thinking we've walked all this way and um, we wouldn't be able to qualify it. But we did. We did. Uh, we managed it in the end. And um, there was me working my fourth contact to qualify uh, the completion of um, Wales as well. A few weeks later to Alan um, on um, a summit called Wentwood. Uh, where it was 159 summits in 245 days. So um, it's been, it was a busy year last year. Obviously, activations and exploring. Uh, I've got to see Germany, a summit called FAST, um, uh, Moritzburg, uh, which was in Hanover. Uh, really, really nice places. I, find, um, I found out in Germany that they've got a bench uh, on, uh, on every summit, which is, it's like I call luxury soda, which is really good, to be honest with you. But meeting fantastic people as well. Uh, after an activation is uh, is really really good and you can just catch up on all your um, experience um, over the years of um, activating portable uh, mountain goat uh, equals all kinds of weather uh, yeah so um, the 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 weather that you do have to go through they they, they have a bonus season for SOTA which runs from uh, December the 1st up until Feb uh, March the 15th I think it is or March the 16th so um, you get an extra three points for every two point and above summit you do. So it, it really, really does um, get people out on the hills to, to operate. So you do find that um, you do get plastered with uh, quite a lot of snow, hail, rain. Um, not much sun uh, this time of year, unfortunately. Uh, that was me with a friend of mine, Richie, at um, Robert Bauer. 
we uh, we had a couple of foot of snow. It was the day after the big storm we had here in uh, in Wales, Arwen. Uh, and then uh, you do actually get some sun now and again. There's Van Vauer uh, in South Wales, number five. Uh, a very early morning activation. That was when the sun was rising. So you do get to see some really nice um, sights when you're operating portable. Um, I've also done a charity activation for the NSPCC. So I was, um, uh, well, I signed up to do um, a 5K walk in aid of the NSPCC charity. And uh, don't ask why, it ended up being um, a 15k hike to Snowdon on the 21st of December last year um, in the freezing cold. I think it was minus 14 winds on the top with snow and uh, about 30, 40 mile an hour winds. Uh, but I activated on two meters by the trig. I did actually try my best to get on top of the trig, but I, I, I couldn't. I I got there, but I, I failed to activate actually on the trig uh, because uh, it was... Um, it was just iced over and <clears throat> there it there i was on top of the snowden summit uh, with the uh, summit itself as i call it uh, managed managed to do the walk and um, there's wa waving the flag when i qualified i did actually um put the 80 meter end fed half wave antennae up uh, right on the top of snowden and i worked 80 meters that was quite a mission uh, but it was uh, it was a very good experience uh, to have uh, and I can't forget about my companion, uh, Mr. Brown, uh, who's been with me on quite a lot of summits. He uh, He's a very, very good little dog. He runs around and uh, you'll never run away when, when you're activating. He sits by you and there he is watching the sun rise uh, in, on Moilus Cavanagod, which is in North Wales. And um, he's a great company. And it's always nice to have company with you when you're on the hills, um, especially uh, when you're, you're walking miles in a day and there's nobody about. It's pretty remote. Uh, I thought I'd give a little bit of a talk about Country Farm. Um, I was asked by uh, the SOTA to start off with, and I think it was the RSGB were involved, to um, set up a portable station on the island of Flatholm to uh, explain about operating portable and to work some SOTA activators. So I really had the easy job. I, I had to get up, well, say not too easy. I had to get up two o'clock in the morning and drive to Cardiff and uh, get, a, get, get a boat across to Flatow Island and wait all day uh, and then and set, set a portable station up. Now, my station uh, comprised of the, the ASU FT857, pushing 80 watts into a homemade 40 meter dipole. Uh, this was a massive risk because I didn't know what conditions were like. Uh, I couldn't pack too much because they'd obviously got a lot of stuff on the on the boat that they were taking down. So um, I risked it and it worked very well. Conditions uh, were good. UK into G propagation. So I managed to work quite a few stations and uh, Fraser was one of those as well, um, which was um, which was yeah good contact. Uh, contesting, just a bit about my contesting work. So I've done quite a lot of portable operating uh, on 145 megahertz fm contesting uh, i've got a little quad bike so I, I drive up to a local hill that, that that's not a soda summit uh, and activate uh, stroke portable uh, with with a battery and my my laptop for 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 contesting uh, also i have done contesting from um, from the summit uh, from local summits and this is what operating portable um why operating portable is a benefit when um when you're contesting, uh, because again, line of sight for two meters, when you're high up, you were many, many more stations, low noise level. And um, I did this for the full year of 2021. And I did manage, I was a two W zero at the time. I managed to win the um, the one four four megahertz FM uh, AC contest. So going portable definitely does have its benefits uh, when it comes to contesting. Uh, it's a success of um, operating portable. Calling CQ, 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 DX 10 meters. Uh, I used to do a lot. I did quite like my um, older radios. So the President Lincoln Mark I, I used to use a lot on 10 meters uh, from um, a local hill of ours. There's my old Freelander with a, with a Sirio 827 right on the top. And uh, yeah, I used to call out CQ, uh, work DX. I uh, used to run a few nets as well. Um, so it was really, really, really um, interesting to the people that I they spoke to. And again, the takeoff on 10 meters on the top of a hill was was uh, was absolutely brilliant. You'd get quite a lot of American uh, stations calling in when uh, when conditions were good. 
Um, so I hope to do that again this summer. Uh, I really did enjoy that, especially the 10 meter net. Uh, when 10 meters is working well, when you're, when you're stroke portable, you will, uh, you'll work quite a lot of stations. Uh, again, calling uh, on 20 meters. I've been out in the morning really, really early with the Ellicraft KX2 pushing 10 watts into uh, the NFED half wave. Uh, I've worked uh, quite a few VK stations, um, uh, Victor Kilo stations uh, in Australia, uh, pushing yet yeah, only 10 watts into, into not a vertical. It was into the um, inverted VN fed half wave. So when, the, when conditions are there and, and you, um, you go portable, no lo noise floor, uh, you will work these stations and it, and the excitement is uh yeah it, it's it's really really good especially when you hear the victor kilo coming in or even zulu lima but uh, i'm yet to work uh, a zulu lima station portable but it will come uh time time will uh, it'll come so just a few tips and, and advice from uh from uh, portable my portable experience um and if you do actually want to go into operating sota i find when operating on VHF, UHF, uh, nearby a comms tower, a band pass filter uh, will be extremely helpful. So uh, quite a lot of us have done this activated close to a comms tower and the comms tower takes the receive. So people can hear you when you're calling out on two meters and you're just wondering, uh, even 70 centimeters, why you're not receiving any signals. Uh, it's because of the comms tower. So SOTA beams do an absolutely fabulous uh, little two meter band pass filter, which uh, is very light. You, bait, you, you can um, screw it in, depending on what radio you've got, you can screw it into the top or you can get a little patch lead to screw it in and then uh, have, a, have another patch lead coming out to your antennae. That certainly works. It cuts all the comms noise out and um, you can have a successful activation. I wish I could have had one of those, um, yeah, a few times when I've been on a, being there close to a comms tower. So where to get SOTA Summit routes from? Um, so last, uh, there's the link there. Uh, so if if um, if my presentation and my talk has uh, you, you made you feel like you do want to have a go at it or go work in Stroke Portable, there's lots of SOTA summits. Uh, if you go onto the website and check, um, there's quite a lot of um, easier ones and there's moderate ones and challenging ones. Just depends what what uh, what what you'd like to do. But don't let it put you off that they're all mountains. They're not. There's quite a few drive on ones that you'll find uh, for you to have a go to start off with. Go to SOTLAS. You'll be able to get your um, your information from there. And I use OS Maps. That's what's downloaded onto my phone and my Garmin. And uh, OS Maps are great. Uh, and on SOTLAS, you'll find they've got the GPX files for all the routes. Uh, in Wales anyway, and majority of the England routes. So you can download them onto your OS maps and uh, and you've got the, the actual, um, the route to, to walk to the summit. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a real good bit of software OS maps is. Best place to purchase portable equipment from, well, in my experience, uh, Sota Beams, uh, there's their link there. They have a wide selection of all different uh, poles, antennas, uh, your pegs, uh, if you want to make antennas, they sell the wire, they, they sell um, everything really to um, to keep you uh, out on the hills or um, port or, or just for portable operating. So I really do recommend them. They're uh, they're a great, uh, great company for for portable equipment. And then I was just going to finish, uh, finish off with some goals that I'm going to set myself for 2023. And that's to do more CW activations. <clears throat> I have started. Uh, doing CW, uh, but uh, once bonus season's over, which is in March this year, I really, really, really do plan to go out and uh, do as many uh, CW activations as I can. Um, gain second mountain goat status. Uh, I'm not going to say it's impossible. Uh, I never uh, believe anything's uh, impossible, but um, I'm going to try my best to get uh, my second mountain goat this year if I can. Um, so. It means bonus season is going to be quite busy for me, uh, but I, like I say, I do really enjoy it. And uh, the third goal is to complete all the summits in England. So uh, if uh, if anybody uh, is is around and they see my uh, my my alerts or my spots, please yeah, please feel free to to give me a call. That will be uh, much appreciated. And I'll finish off by uh, giving you a little bit of information. Now I was asked if I had a YouTube channel. Um, I have, but I've got to be honest with you, I really don't update it very often. So uh, it hasn't got a great uh, amount of information on there. So I have spoken to a good friend of mine, Fraser, 
and he has got a fantastic YouTube channel. I'm not trying to sell it, <laughs> but um, if you really want to find out more about operating portable on a SOTA summit uh, physically by actually watching videos, um, I really, 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 really recommend you um, you have a look at some of Fraser's um, YouTube videos because he really does explain uh, about the operating procedures and SOTA in a fantastic way. So um, there's a link to his channel. Please, please um, have a look at it. It's got much, much, much more information and much better information on it than I have. And, uh, and um, yeah, subscribe and give him a like. <laughs> uh, and then if anybody's got any questions uh, or they'd like to know any information um, from myself on uh, equipment, um, anything to do with SOTA, if you'd like uh, a hand on, how to get started or anything like that my email address is there please 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 feel free to uh, send me an email because um, i uh, i'll support and um, offer my help as much as i can um, on on that uh, front so on on that note sorry i haven't i haven't uh, hope i haven't bored anybody with my presentation it's hard now and again talking to a screen as we all know it's uh, it's getting to be the future without an audience but uh, i just like to say thank you thank you very much for um yeah for for listening to my presentation and uh, I'll say 73 wish everybody a happy new year hope to speak to you all from the hill soon and I think this is the time where I pass the microphone back to David so yeah over to you David from GW4 BML Portable well Ben thank you very much yeah don't go yet please because we've got a few comments and questions for you yet so uh, if you have got any questions or comments for Ben you haven't already asked them then please do it now on either the YouTube chat or the BATC messaging and we'll be happy to relay them to Ben. Don't forget your first name and also your call sign if you've got one as well on those. So yes, Ben, we've got lots of other messages. I mean, it's almost breathtaking. Um, I have to say, uh, in this job, I get to, you know, to get to see quite a lot of people and a lot of talks, um, but yours truly is inspirational. I mean, if only for the scenery, I think even if you weren't interested in radio and saw some of those fantastic, breathtaking scenes that you've been, that, that this has allowed you to do, you know, it's, it's quite something. I'm, I'm intrigued though about summits in England. I'm not sure there are too many. I'm based in Norfolk here and there aren't very many except maybe Cromer, I think so. Uh, but anyway, let's hear from everybody um, with your questions and comments for Ben. Firstly, from Richard Haynes, who's MW0RHX. He says, I'm not far from Ben in Powys. Um, last time we spoke, I was MW6RBH and you contacted the air ambulance for me on Strata, Florida. Okay, I know Richard uh, very well, but I don't know as he got that mixed up. Um, the air ambulance. I'm not too sure. I know I've spoken to Richard quite a few times, but I, I don't recall contacting the air ambulance well, for him. I could just add a, a little suffix to that. He did actually put yeah. in Hello Esther in the middle, and I'm not sure. I oh, couldn't see, he might be talking. But yes, I couldn't was, see any uh, Esther I, in the list, so I thought it was a kind of a typo. So my apologies if I've got that wrong. It, it's okay, but I do know that story because, yeah, um, I believe that um, I think Esther uh, was with with uh, with Raynette and, and Richard did as, is as well. And they did help each other out. That is correct. But I wasn't involved in that one. Sorry. OK, my apologies if I've confused anything there as well, Richard. Um, several other comments, though, um, from um, Kelly to e zero HDT. POTA seems to have a massive following in the US. Is this gaining traction in the UK? That's Parks on the air, isn't it? Yeah, that's Parks on the air. Um, I have actually got quite a few friends um, which do do POTA. It's it's one thing I haven't myself um, got into yet. I, I do call into stations when I know that they're, so I chase it, I suppose. Um, but a few friends of mine have um, have recently gone into POTA, yes. But I've always said like Parks on the air, I suppose you can you can drive um to, to to the actual activation zone and you can activate um from anywhere so parks in the air is a very good scheme like that but while i'm trying my best to keep active and keep as fit as i can i will keep trying to use my legs until uh, and, and then i will i will move on to uh, to pota in time but uh, i'm quite enjoying quite enjoying sota and you are in the right place for it after all in wales yeah aren't you? yeah um, so we've got i'm just explaining hills. that because well for because we've got quite an international audience usually for these uh, webinars and so um, you know Wales has got rather a lot more hills than uh, many other parts of at least England anyway I think yes uh, it, it, yeah. you did mention England and I know a lot of people will be watching from there what what are your sort of thoughts about 
places to go in England? Where are you aiming to go? You've mentioned the Lake District, um, I believe. Well, the Lake District is going to be uh, one on my list to do. They've got some absolutely beautiful scenery up in the Lake District. Um, I've never, <clears throat> I've never ever been to the Lake District um, to to do any hiking uh, until I started SOTA. I've done quite a lot in Wales before I was uh, even licensed. But um, the Lake District, uh, yeah, beautiful scenery. Um, Scottish Borders, uh, which is just uh, on the English side. Uh, I, I'm um, planning to go there and Devon and Cornwall. Uh, there's another place that I need to go to uh, to have a holiday with the family. It, it's very, uh, I'm I'm very lucky that my XYL loves her hiking, and we've got a little one, Lyra. She um she loves coming coming with us as well, which is great. So we can kind of have it as a family break. We we do a bit of hiking, a bit of radioing, and do a bit of shopping. So it, it all works out well. Uh, and then North Pennines. So there, there's still quite a lot I've got to do in uh, in England yet. Probably the best part of a hundred summits. And yeah, and it was lovely to see that you involved the whole family in a lot of these trips as well. I don't know if I've got the pronunciation right. Trifan, is that? I think there was a picture of you and your two-year-old and on your back, and then your yeah. radios one each side, uh, and your <laughs> wife next to you. I mean, that's that's quite a trek, and you really have to be quite dedicated, I think, to do that sort of thing, don't you? Well, Trivan's one of those where, uh, as I s explained, Martha's always wanted to um, to climb Trivan. It's one that she's never done. She's done most of them in Wales, but uh, that that is one of the like the top ten that she hadn't done. So we said, right, let's do it. And uh, and Lyra came with us. And there is a path that you can go, you can go to Trivan, which is uh, relatively safe. Let's just say it's a safe path. And um, yeah, we went on that one. But I did have some looks, especially with. Uh, nearly a two-year-old on my back <laughs> but they were like people were yeah they thought it was really 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 good to be fair but she loves the outdoors and as I said I'm lucky it's, it's good yeah it's very nice isn't it to see that um, now Paul M7 PMK has got a question on lightweight antennas telescope sorry on lightweight telescopic poles for wire antennas he says that I've read a few operators using a carbon fiber poles from soda beams and my understanding is that they were they would recommend them over fiberglass. Have you got any feelings about that? Well, I, um, I've i always used the Tactical Mini, which is the fiberglass six meter pole. And to let, let you in with a little secret, over the last two weeks, um, I snapped my pole, uh, not two weeks, the last week, I snapped my pole on um, New Year's Day. So my, my six meter pole, and because soda beams have run out of um, sections that I need, uh, I think I've taken all this stock. Um, the, the the six meter carbon I got in the in the house here. It's the first time I've ever used it, and I was I was very impressed. It really really lightened my load. Uh, it's a much 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 lighter um, pole. I did find I don't know was it how I, I I put put the pole up, but I did find the SWR was a bit different on um, on the carbon pole to the tactical mini pole. I had to retune it. Uh, it wasn't wasn't much out, but uh, I, I had to retune it. But for actually uh, erecting the pole and putting your antennae up, I, I do believe the six meter soda beams carbon pole is probably a bit better than the tactical mini. Uh, and uh, and it's a lot, lot lighter. So it might be coming with me a little bit more. OK, thanks for that uh, advice. Uh, Steve MW0SAW says, what size in litres is your rucksack, Ben? My rucksack is a 30 two litre rucksack it's either a 32 or a 36 i think it's a 32 litre uh, it's it's a the actual make of it is um a dieter uh delta echo uniform tango echo romeo it's a german make dieter and i think it's a 32. and you managed to fit everything that you've got there that first aid kit and everything it's amazing yeah everything it's got quite a lot of pockets it's it's quite a good rucksack but yeah it's it's a good good quality and it is uh again it's been probably it's been with me now for a yeah, a year, a good, probably sixteen months, and it's still it showing signs of age, but it's yeah, it's it's okay, it's still good. going strong. Thank you. Actually, related to that slightly, uh, Graham uh, G six NWC, I believe, from memory. Uh, do you carry used bivy bags or some kind of shelter, some form of shelter? I carry a bothy bag with me but I have never used the Bothy bag ever. The only time it's been used is when Lyra, Lyra and uh, Martha, uh, they used it when uh, when one of the summits was a little bit windy, but I, I haven't. I The way I operate, 
I either find some stones, find a wall um, to shade, or if I am on top of a, a hill where I've got no shade, I will, I've, well, with my, I've got my leggings on, I wear my leggings and my waterproof jacket uh, wherever I go. I'll kind of ha- huddle down uh, in like a little ball and I'll have the radio literally right in front of me while I'm writing the log quick. So I, I, I haven't, haven't ever used a shelter yet. I think you mentioned that you, you do take as well, though, sometimes a, 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 fil- a presumably aluminium or something sort of sh- blanket type of thing, a silver blanket. Is that I, right? I have a, I have a foil blanket, but that that foil blanket's just in a little packet. It's just in case if I ever had a fall or or uh, I, I, I touch wood. I hope I don't. But if I if I broke a bone or something and I couldn't move, it would keep me warm. And 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 again, if I did ever come across somebody that was on a on a mountain which uh, was in the same condition, I've got it with me so I can wrap them up if that makes sense to to keep them warm. Mm. But um, I was uh, yeah. I, to, sorry, beg your pardon. No, 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 you go. I was just going to say that I was intrigued. I don't know if I'm the only one watching who wasn't really aware that GPSs have come on so much and that, that the Garmin one you mentioned and maybe others as well have a transmit function for emergency that contacts satellites and things. I, I had no idea that they sort of gone that far. I, I haven't really looked at one of those for, for some years now. Um, so is that yeah. something that you recommend for walkers, regardless of whether you're doing amateur radio or not? Presumably that's a very good kit, a bit of kit to have with you. Yeah, I've like I say, I've I've always used um, well in, in the past. I've used my APRS, and I even even had uh, an eye gate, uh, an NOV for an eye gate for for APRS here that I I built and put on top of a of a hill. But it just didn't. When you were going on long runs, uh, it didn't pick you up until you were up on the hill. And when you're up on the hill, it's a little bit bit too late. I found it then. So yeah, I was speaking just speaking and asked the question, what would be uh, what what is one of the best uh, or a good GPS to go for? And it was actually um, Fraser and a couple of other people uh, had put that they'd got this um, GP GPS 66i, the Garmin, and uh, it, it's brilliant. It's absolutely great. Um, you could you can track yourself. And all I do is as soon as I start my walk, I press a button on it, and it uses a satellite send the messages. I, I I usually have a good friend of mine. Alan, uh, GW4VPX, as I was talking about before, because he's done practically uh, every, every, well, he has done every mountain in Wales and, and quite a lot in England. What well, a message goes to him, my girlfriend uh, as well, uh, just so that they can track me. And uh, they actually can. It's very good. It tracks you to the actual spot you're standing on. So if I leave it on when I'm at home and uh, I've got my rucksack, you can see where I've walked, walked through the rooms in the house. It tracks it that well. Yeah. So, yeah, I do recommend. That's really good. And as you say, things like APRS only depend on, you know, being able to be within range of, a, of another two meter station. And I guess phone GPS, the same sort of thing. If you're not within range of a, a mast, yeah. it's not going to help the, you. The phone, um, believe it or not, and quite a lot of people maybe that are, that are listening or, or, or will watch that um, the phone signal 4G is, uh, is, is, is quite useless on top of a lot of hills. I've been to the Lake District on quite a few mountains. I'm on, um, it's it's BT, it's classed as, but it, it works through EE. That's my um, my signal uh, provider on my phone. And uh, yeah, there's many mountains I've been on as high as possible and I have no signal. Uh, it happened to me at the weekend. Um, I'd got no signal, I couldn't spot. So that's where the GPS comes in handy. You know for a fact when you're on a high spot, it's going to find a satellite in the sky to send uh, to send signals off. So it is. It's always good to have because you've got that as a as another option just in case. Yeah, thank you. Um, Nick M Seven CQX asks, do you orientate your antenna or just randomly set it up? Randomly, <clears throat> I randomly set it up. So uh, my HF antenna is just a complete inverted V. So I've got about sixty six foot of wire. Uh, running into, um, uh, I shouldn't sell this design because it was uh, it's Steve uh, the it's MW0SAW that made it, but it's it's a little 49 to one um, Unun, which which a uh, transformer which has 66 foot of wire uh, that comes out of it, and halfway uh, about yeah 30 uh, 33 foot of wire. There's um, a little uh, what do you call it a clip with, with with a couple of circles in where it's tied to. And then that goes on top of my pole. So I've got, say, like 32, 33 foot uh, of wire coming out the one side, 33 the other. And I do it, I do it in a dead straight inverted V. And I make, make sure both ends are a meter above the ground. So on the, on the far end, it's got three meters of um, uh, nylon cord. So three meters of nylon cord when it's uh, on, on a 
on an angle is about a meter above the ground where the wire starts and then my walking pole holds the um uh, the winder uh, which is about a meter above the ground and it works perfect works really really well to be fair i have some really good reports with that and i've ordered another two from him for my spare stock <laughs> just in case so i do recommend that antenna uh, it's very light very very light you can just carry it with it on your little finger and uh, and and it it does do the business sounds really good thank you uh, steve 20xsh says what band do you typically find best when working portable sota Ooh, it depends on conditions that 40 meters at the moment has been absolutely brilliant um absolutely great um you, i think I, I was out the other day and i think i hit 57 stations in the log rip rip rap um straight away uh, on 40. i like 60 but um uh, the only one thing about 60 is not everybody can 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 operate it so i try my best to concentrate on 40 um 20 meters challenging because you get quite a lot of um eu stations calling into you and uh, uh it's uh, well, they all call at the same time so it's picking out picking out call signs uh, and working working through the stations but yeah i i'd say 40 meters uh, would be 40 meters would be one of my favorite bands um to, to work on because the antenna is not too long sticking the 80 meter end fed half wave up is yeah you have to sprint <laughs> and, and i guess that's going to that's going to change as well with propagation conditions and things varying. Yes. yeah yeah um okay you've got lots of comments and, and love of your mr brown the dog um you'll be pleased <laughs> to know lots of fans here um nick h says i've also found the audio on the x6100 which is your zygo uh, standby yeah. radio wasn't it a little lacking yeah. so he always uses an external speaker which much improves things that's one thing that I've got to say uh, I haven't tried, and I, I I will when when the summer like I say when um, when the summertime comes and then you can have when the weather's better you could have time you can have hours on top of a summit to to test equipment it's uh, it's it's nice in nice weather I'll I'll have a play then but but um, no means is um, is the radio um, not a bad radio because it, it it's per it's been uh, that radio's been to germany with me a few times it's an absolute cracking radio and i've been asked by a few people would i sell it and i'm like no no that is literally my backup radio i i would take that with me the in the internal tuner is worth a lot and i think i paid something like 550 pound for it like 550 pound for a 160 to 10 meter oh well i think it's got um six meters on it as well uh radio uh, with a built-in tuner with a scope and, uh, and a built-in microphone if you needed to, to, to use it as well, and an internal battery. You, you're getting a lot for your money, uh, yeah. and it works. Yeah, it does sound really good. Um, Matthew M0ZMS says, thanks for the presentation. Just started in SOTA, enjoying dragging the girlfriend up many a remote summit and improving my setup every time. I find I learn more and more with each activation. That 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 is a hundred percent true. When I first started operating, <laughs> it's quite funny when you look back. When I first started operating, you'd have thought I was going on holiday when I was walking up a mountain. Uh, it was like I got a suitcase on my back. Uh, I used to pack everything, absolutely everything, with me, um, from like a tuner to to the radio, to a spare microphone, to two batteries, to like three antennas. Or what if this doesn't work? What if that doesn't work? I used to carry a seven meter. I first started off with a seven meter um, uh, DX Commander pole. Oh, it's like a meter. Uh, what does it stand? I think it's about. Is it uh, over a meter? about 1.2 meters standing out your rucksack going going up snowden with that i i that's one of the first activations i did uh, snowden with with that and the amount of looks you get <laughs> so uh, matt you will 100 percent uh take a lot of stuff up at the start it's just normal that is normal and then you'll uh, look back in i'll give yourself about four four months you'll look back and you'll think why did i bother taking all that stuff up so all, all i take with me now is like i say the kx2 the battery and uh, just my guy and stuff little light pole and uh, the end uh, end fed half wave and it's really really light and i do carry i do do carry a spare antenna with me but that little winder antenna doesn't weigh and it, it just it probably the same weight as this pen so um but you you will find matt you'll learn a lot as you as you go on but i hope you enjoy it and, and if you need any anything or any questions just yeah feel free to give me an email Thank you. I should mention as well at this point that I'll, I'll get the uh, links, some of the links that you've included in your presentation, if that's all right, and we'll put it into the notes 
uh, for the present for this presentation once we put it up on on YouTube as well uh, where people can watch it because um, Thomas K4 SWL says I missed the first portion of this presentation so just for you as well Thomas you know the, this will be up and recorded and it'll be there permanently on the RSGB YouTube channel so you better watch what you've missed anyway he says that um, perhaps this is mentioned but I'm curious if you've done SOTA outside the UK and if so how that might differ from Wales um okay I've done SOTA in Germany um, that's the only country really that I've been uh, I've operated uh, out of uh, abroad and I've got to be honest with you it's just like luxury SOTA the walks are quite flat uh, I hope there's nobody listening now because they'll be <laughs> sending me some nasty messages but they're uh, yeah they're, they're, they're quite flat and they've got benches on the top so and some have got shelters and even pubs the one I went to had like a public house on the top it, 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 with food and a restaurant. It's, uh, but I, I know you, you will get harder, harder summits than that, but um, they do differ to Wales or very much different to Wales. Um, you can find a one point summit in Wales, about three miles to walk. There's, um, there's one called Gamath, which is a one point summit in, um, I think it's North Wales. Uh, just not far from Dolge uh, on the on the Dolgetli to Mahantloth Road, uh, so not far from um, Cad Cadar Idris, and um, yeah, it's a one point summit. And oh my goodness, I'd rather climb Snowdon any day of the week. I'd rather climb Cadar Idris to be fair than than climb that. It was just um, about two miles uphill, vertical uphill. It was a horrible climb. Uh, so like the, the hills we have in Wales are they're not the best. Let's just say. But uh, the ones, yeah, ones in Germany are quite nice. And I'm hoping to, but I haven't, haven't, haven't said this yet. But uh, I am planning on, planning on going to uh, hopefully Australia and New Zealand in in a month's time. So uh, we'll uh, we'll find out the proper way of operating quite a long way away from uh, from home. So fingers crossed that is. Well, good luck with that as well. As I said, lots and lots of good companies. You'll be able to look at them yourself after the talk, Ben. But lots of compliments and, and thanks and everything. Uh, also, I mentioned right at the beginning. A message which I didn't quite maybe get right. It was about uh, someone called Esther, who uh, or Richard was talking about yeah. uh, someone called Esther who'd called him out, and we, we've got uh, Esther's actually come on now. Esther, her call son G I zero A Z A, um, and says to Richard and to you that was an eventful day. It was an amazing to be able to get the air ambulance for you that day following our H F contact, and we were on an, a W A B activation day in Northern Ireland. So there we go. It just shows you how that can. Uh, yeah, that, I'll say hello to uh, Esther. Absolutely. Um, uh, there's several people just, I'm trying to sort of summarise some of these comments there. Uh, ben, do you ever use tablet logging? Uh, that's Esther actually asking that question. Do you ever use a tablet for logging? <laughs> no, no. And it's quite funny you bring that topic up now because I was on the phone to Fraser last week for about an hour trying to um, trying to uh, go through uh, VK Portalog. <clears throat> he, uh, I, what, what it is, is I, I've downloaded VK Portalog which is a, it's a login function for Android phones. Uh, it's, it's just Android only. And you, the stories you hear about, it, it's fabulous. It works brilliant. It works brilliant. But because of the days now and again that I do, you know, you do multiple summits, usually may, maybe even four to, to six, eight summits a day. And you can imagine if you have something like anything from 10 contacts to 50 contacts on each summit and you're relying on, a phone or a tablet to key everything in and you get home and you find out it's lost it all yeah you can quite understand the frustration but no uh, I, I was talking yet yeah, to, to Fraser about I'm going to try it I'm going to do it but I will I just need to get the guts and the courage to uh, to actually try um, login but I, I haven't yet Esther I am old-fashioned I use the pen and I'm still using a piece of paper that's that's my uh, that's my login technique at the moment I reckon it might be a bit lighter as well somehow. Yeah. <laughs> Talking of weight, actually, uh, Chris Hardy's come on and said, thank you, Ben. Very enjoyable viewing. Hope to get out with the Klansman soon. Yikes. He says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that's a fairly heavy military radio, I believe. Um, a few other comments. Paul uh, Gibson says, pub on top of a, a soda. I'm packing my bag and radio now. <laughs> um, and um, Kevin... Uh, MW0KXN says, how good it is to hear familiar call signs from a summit. Well, who's going to call in first? Christian, Lars, Frank, Don, Alan, Manuel, and of course, you, Ben. So uh, there we are. So obviously people who know you from uh, that, working. That, that, that is another thing as well, because you kind of, 
Well, that is another point which I really didn't bring up. Uh, I, I mentioned the friends part of thing, but um, I should actually, because because I didn't want to really base this on just SOTA uh, as it was a portable operation um, presentation. But like um, you're right, like it, it is like one big big family. Because when you go up onto a SOTA summit, and if you haven't heard these these call signs, it's like it's not an activation, you, you know, because they always call in, and it's real nice when you hear them. And uh, and you can have um, you can have a little bit of a natter on air with them as well at the same time. So yeah, I suppose I'd like to thank 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 them all for for their support because um, it is great. But you're right there, Kevin. Um, if you haven't heard the the the, the normals, uh, uh, it's it is not an activation. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, it's a great way. I mean, we we hopefully all of us get friendship from our hobby. But I mean, you've shown that it can really be fun and 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 great to get out and and be active as well. Um, with portal operating thank you very very much for tonight ben i think that, that exhausts most of our questions and things there but said lots of compliments and thanks from everybody who's watched it and all gone i'm sure to enjoy this um, i'm going to leave the last words actually to one of the team from the rsgb who um, put this series together uh, graham g8 nwc says what a fascinating presentation passionate and a great orator and i, I echo that thank you very much indeed ben for sharing your passion in amateur radio with us tonight no thank you very much it's been a pleasure thank Wonderful. you thank you and as i said that the details and some of the links as well that ben has put will be putting onto the rsgb website very soon but that concludes this webinar and thanks once again to ben lloyd gw4 bml and the rsgb team uh, who put this together as well and also studio director tammy palmer m0 tc we hope you've enjoyed this tonight today and that you'll be able to join us next time when Anthony Luskra K8ZT will join us to talk about QRP operating. And if you'd like to see details of this and other webinars in the series, please visit rsgb.org forward slash webinars, where you can also send us comments and feedback. And before I go, another reminder about the RSGB construction competition, where you still have time to complete projects before the deadline of March 1st, 2023. Entry is free for all RSGB members and is again all online this time, so you'll not have to send your work away to be judged. You can find full details by going to this special webpage, rsgb.org forward slash construction dash competition, or looking in the latest editions of Radcom. And finally, a tip that if you subscribe to the RSGB's YouTube channel, you'll be notified of all upcoming Tonight at 8 webinars, as well as other new videos and presentations from the Society on a wide range of amateur radio topics. But until next time, this is David G7RP signing off and clear. Bye-bye.